This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. One evening I saw this happen on television on a late night talk show with a guest panel consisting of a bearded guitar player, two nightclub singers, a Hollywood actor, and an author who had come to promote his latest book. The conversation turned to the topic of death. From his repertoire of witticisms, the host of the talk show remarked that he wanted to die at 91 after having been shot by a jealous husband. But then he turned to his guests and asked how they wanted to die, what they thought about death. At this point, the cameraman did a slow scan showing each person sitting on the couch, and the gallery of facial expressions which swept across the screen constituted one of the most fascinating 15 seconds I have ever seen in all of television. The guitar player began nervously biting his lip. I presume he was biting his lip. He appeared to have begun munching his beard. One of the nightclub singers wrinkled her nose. The Hollywood actor seemed to have become suddenly, unaccountably fascinated with staring at his shoelaces while fidgeting with his cufflinks. The author momentarily lost all control of himself, began literally writhing about in his chair. This is true. He began coughing simultaneously and clearing his throat uncomfortably. But it was the other nightclub singer who gave the most honest reaction. She contorted her face into a grimace, stuck out her tongue, and loudly declared, Yick, which appeared an accurate summation of the attitudes of everybody else on the couch. Instantaneously, the host of this program perceived that if he did not manage to get off the subject of death, his program itself was about to go into rigor mortis, so he quickly turned to the talk of a Hollywood marriage scandal, and in a few moments after that, everybody was cheerfully discussing whether next year's hemlines would go up or down. They did not want to think about, much less talk about, death. Why do people fear that subject? What is death? What happens afterward? William Derrick, the late dean of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University, said, and I quote, The continued influence of those departed this life and the sense of reality of the continuing existence of their personalities have been strong enough to remove for me any doubt as to some form of life after death. What it is, or in what form, I care not, but I believe that we continue to exist. William James of Harvard once said that his interest in personal immortality was not of the keenest order, but his belief grew stronger as he grew older, and when he was asked why, he replied, because I am just now getting fit to live. James Martineau, on his 80th birthday, said, how small a part of my life work have I been able to carry out? Nothing is as plain as this, that life at its fullest on earth is only a fragment. Arthur H. Compton, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, has written, It takes a whole lifetime to build the character of a noble man, the adventures and disciplines of youth, the struggles and failures and successes, the pains and pleasures of maturity, the loneliness and tranquility of age. These make up the fire through which he must pass to bring out the pure gold of his soul. Having been thus perfected, what shall nature do with him? Annihilate him? What an infinite waste. I prefer to believe, wrote... Nobel Prize winning physicist Arthur H. Compton, I prefer to believe man lives on after death, continuing in a larger sphere, in cooperation with his maker, the work he had here begun. How then might one think of death? Some years ago, in Elkhart, Indiana, was an old school teacher named Professor S. B. McCracken, who passed away, and the inscription he composed for his tombstone reads as follows. School is out. Teacher has gone home. That's what dying is. Going home, it is passing on to a new realm of higher reality to begin a process of endless progress and growth, ascending through the universe, evolving in soul and in character, becoming godlike. For the Master declared, Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, and it will take eternity to accomplish that. No philosophy of life is complete without a philosophy of death. Professor John Finnegan, the archaeologist, has collected a series of funeral inscriptions from the days of the ancient Roman Empire, which depict beliefs about the meaning of death prevalent before the times of Jesus. Here are some actual epitaphs from Roman tombstones, and I quote, I paid my debt to nature 
and have departed. Another one. I was, I am not, I do not care. Another. What I have eaten and what I have drunk, that is all that belongs to me. Another quote. While I lived, I drank, drink all ye who live. And finally, eat, drink, and play, and then come hither. Those were epitaphs, the final inscriptions on tombstones of early Romans before the time of Christ. But compared to those, these epitaphs, found by archaeologists, the epitaphs of those who called themselves Christians, who were early followers of this charismatic carpenter, this Jesus of Nazareth, nearly 2,000 years ago. Listen to these. For one man... It was written, May his sleep be in peace. Another, Thou wilt live in God. Thou wilt live forever. Another, May God refresh thy spirit. That is the profound difference belief in immortality makes in the view of death. Consider the accompanying difference a belief in immortality makes in the living of human life. The vivid awareness that life on this perturbed planet is but the beginning. That man has a rendezvous with destiny beyond the sparkling stars of space. That a human being is not composed of flesh alone, but that within each one there burns an imprisoned splendor. The living spirit of the living God. The kingdom of God is within you, declared the master. And to believe that is really to begin to live, not only here, but literally for all eternity. One of the most famous pieces of music in history is the Austrian composer Franz Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. It was given that title because he died in 1828 before he could complete the manuscript. And yet it is my conviction that Schubert will finish his symphony and will hear it played by an orchestra far better than any here, for I believe in life beyond the grave, the life of every good man or woman is an unfinished symphony of a sort, a masterpiece of music just begun. How could death end that? Johann Sebastian Bach is dead, yet his music lives on. And if, as he said, his music poured forth from his soul, and if his music lives on, is it then so strange to think his soul lives on as well? How could dying touch that? Death may end heartbeat and breathing, but what of the personality, what of the character, creativity, wisdom, kindness of a man or a woman? Can a person's personality, will, character, love, and honesty be sealed in the coffin with him and molder to dust in the grave? These things are not physical at all. How could physical death end them? Is life a staircase to no place? I cannot think so. There is a purpose to human existence. What would you think if you went to a play at a theater and at the end of the first act of a fascinating drama with an exceedingly intriguing storyline, the stage manager stepped out between the curtains and said, that's all, folks. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Good night. And then the house lights went up. You would object. You would say, this can't be the end of the drama. It was just beginning to get interesting. So likewise, when death's curtain descends, I cannot believe it all is ended. During one short lifetime on this earth, existence is just beginning to get interesting. There has to be more, and there is. For declared Jesus, I go to prepare a place for you, a place in the universal family of God, in which you are a son or daughter and infinitely loved. And knowing that will make life and death a joy. I personally possess an unwavering faith in eternal life. I can truthfully state I feel as certain of life after death as I am certain of life before death. I am every bit as convinced that I shall live again as I am convinced that I live now. But what survives death? Certainly not the physical body, not this temporary temple of flesh and bone, this physical cloak of clay in which our personalities are wrapped during this brief lifetime on earth. It is the soul which survives, the real you, the living transcript of your mental and your spiritual self, brought into being by the seeking of your mind to find and fathom the wisdom of the indwelling spirit of God, the divine spark which glows within your consciousness to illumine your thinking, to teach you of truth if you will choose to learn. But what thoughts and memories will pass through the portals of dying with you? 
only that of meaning and of value. I envision the soul as something akin to a photographic plate. It only registers the light. When astronomers turn their telescopes to the vast and darkened regions of the midnight sky to photograph the feeble glimmerings of distant stars and galaxies, the film records each silver speck of light against the boundless blackness of silent space. So, too, your living soul is sensitive to every glimmering of spiritual light however faint and flickering it be, and registers each gleam of goodness in your life, each flash of fleeting beauty you have known, and every moment you have lived in the luminescent love of God and of people. And these spiritual experiences, these noblest longings and aspirations, these great hours of courage, compassion, service, friendship, fellowship, adventure, worship, love, and joy, these are the star-like points of light imprinted on your soul. These glow as galaxies of beauty for eternity. Each thought and act of goodness, love and truth, of worship and of joy is a glimmering of light that will never fade. It is yours everlastingly. For by faith you will outlive your body and journey this universe in chariots of light for all eternity and beyond. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI Box 3080, Oakhurst, O A K H U R S T, California, C A L I F O R N I A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.